Hey everybody, and welcome to a revelatory wild ride with Steve-O. A lot is revealed in this episode, let me tell you. Our guest, T.J. Miller, man, not only did he survive brain surgery, but he got really candid about uh, a lot of the uh, struggles that he's had. And uh, man, it almost got uncomfortable. The guy was so candid and, and willing to talk about his lowest points that I earned a lot of respect for him. And God, am I a fan. I'm a real fan of TJ Miller. And I super enjoyed this. It's also the longest episode of the Wild Ride podcast we've ever recorded, I'm reasonably sure. So, man, get ready for a real wild ride here. Now, where am I? Well, I'm in New York City doing an unbelievable amount of press for my book release, which was this Tuesday. My book is available everywhere. Um, you know, I love New York City. I love the attention. I love being active, but I do not love the mattress in this hotel room. Whew. God, do I miss my mattress at home from helixsleep.com. Tell me I get the best night's sleep on my mattress at home. Why? Because when you go to helixsleep.com, you take a simple two-minute quiz and it actually pairs you with the perfect mattress for you and your couple. Even better, if you go to helixsleep.com slash stevo, you get up to $200 off of any mattress that you choose, plus two free pillows. And let me tell you, their pillows are every bit as awesome as their mattresses. It's just too good to be true. You deserve a night's sleep. I bet your mattress is probably old and disgusting. It's time for a new one, and the new one should be from helixsleep.com slash Stevo so that you can get up to $200 off of any mattress plus two free pillows. You deserve it, so jump on it, and let's get into it. All right, here we go. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, TJ Miller. Yes! Yeah, dude. Yeah, man. Hanging in New York City. Wow, Wendy's already out of here. This oh, is good. Wendy's this like, Ugh, New York. Talking about New York. <laughs> no, she thinks she goes up the downstairs. She, she thinks this is for her. She went over and started right. sleeping and thinks that it's dog food, but it's not. We it's might as well you. get this out of the way. That's so let's do it. So this is my hot sauce. Did you coordinate the bag with your outfit? I did not, but you know what? My wife probably did. Because <laughs> Kate sent this, and she wrote a little card for you and me. Let, let, let's so uh, check it out. Open that up. I, I was saying to um, <clears throat> Scott Randolph here. <clears throat> By the way, Scott is my co-host. Scott. Uh, pleasure. Let's co-host the fuck out of this thing. I love it. And uh, thank you for the mangoes. Anytime. I bring a bag of mangoes whenever I'm excited. Before you came on, I was saying to Scott, you know, like, you think of drug dealing, like weed Selling marijuana was the thing, but then it just became stupid to sell weed because selling cocaine was so much more profitable. Right. And I feel like <clears throat> you and I being <clears throat> you and I being hot sauce people, we're like weed guys. Yeah, you know? really. At this point, and people get as addicted to it, and people love my hot sauce. And I paired with a guy, sort of a family friend, who owned a, a pepper farm in Central Indiana, in Zionsville. That's the one I want both of us to try. Fucking intense. It's so funny. I've got Steve-O's hot sauce for your butthole. I love and, that. And then I've got Steve-O's butthole destroyer. Really? Yeah. What I think is weird, and you must have obviously found this, but I, what I think is strange is that um, all the time after shows, people will be like, is this going to make my butthole hurt? And, and also the girls will be like, is this going to just shred his asshole? Is he going to be able to feel his butthole tomorrow? I'm like, I didn't know that was the objective, but there you go. What yeah. made you want to get into the hot sauce game? I love hot sauce. I mean, I think it was yeah. the same for you. I just, I put it on everything. I love it so much. Yeah. And this guy just kind of, we met randomly. I used to be the Mucinex man, that talking booger, you know? Yeah. And so I went and I recorded something in the middle of nowhere near my mother-in-law's like horse farm. And he and I hit it off. We were friends, and he's, he has a pepper farm. He was making his own hot sauce. Years later, he said, do you want to collaborate on a hot sauce? I said, yeah, of course. So I worked for about a year and a half, and we got these three. And it's Chipotle, which is smoky, good flavor, not a lot of heat. 
Extreme Gangster, which is your habanero. That's kind of your better than Tabasco everyday hot sauce. And then the hot one for the pepperheads is fucking intense ghost pepper type shit. And that is the one that people are like, is this going to blow my butthole off? Is yeah. my mouth going to go through my own asshole and come around and eat my fucking head? What's going to happen? Well. And I always say, you know, this one's really <laughs> hot, but it's not gimmicky hot. It still has really, really good flavor. Right. Ooh, so gimmicky I think, hot. I like that. I like it. But do you think, go ahead. I described my. I was going to say something. I was going to say, do you know. Because you went like this. Count? I was like right. holding my breath while you were talking. Uh, do we know the Scoville counts of these? No, not exactly, because it's a little bit relative. But the fucking intense. What's your butthole burning one? The destroyer. Um, I, all I know is that my butthole destroyer. The top three ingredients on the ingredients list are the three hottest peppers on earth. Ghost Carolina pepper, Reaper. Carolina Reaper, and uh, scorpion. Is that right? Yeah. Car yeah. yeah. And, and you said the right answer. Like, it's relative because it's, like, it diluted is. by whatever it's diluted by. But they said ours is roughly, I think, like, 750,000 to a million. So it's, like, anywhere in between those. Yeah, mine's about 749,000. So yeah. it's just, it's, just uh, below that. It's gnarly. Sure and I, des I describe I it like, as gimmicky. I, I describe it as just strictly for the purpose of being ridiculously hot. Like, yeah. uh, gimmicky. See, and so gimmicky hot, which but, is great. That's what people want, like, all the time. Right. They're saying, is this going to hurt my boyfriend? I want to hurt my husband. Right. I want this to hurt my significant what? other. Yeah. Interestingly, I went for as hot as we could possibly get it to be. Well, yeah, I would. That's on brand. I think and, right, the and, idea. Uh, but a lot of the feedback is, even though it is like really hot, it's also delicious. Have you seen that? Yeah, I mean, people I, rave about I, I agree. it. I'm sure, and I mean that's this. It is really hot, but I like ghost pepper because it's got really good flavor, and it's a sneak attack. It sneaks up on you. Yeah. Okay. Where, where can they buy this? Um, on my website, TJ Miller does not have a website. dot com. And this is my merch. It shows this, and I have a line of peanut butter, but I didn't have any, so I'm going to send it to you guys. All right. In Los Angeles. When we go on tour, uh, we always ask about different people's writers, and yours comes up as, like, uh, they say, TJ just wants you to get him, like, the most fucking craziest sandwich you can possibly give him. Yeah, I do. For a while, it was wow. a terrible turkey sandwich. And I said that was open to interpretation. And then also it was a, 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 either a real pinata or a hand-drawn picture of a pinata. So that was really fun. Cause, and I did that because I wanted to see how much they were paying attention, yeah, but also how into, kind of does the club have a sense of humor? So what all the venues started doing is each year they tried to up their terrible turkey sandwich. Mm -hmm. And they would also compete against each other and same with the pinata. So the terrible turkey sandwich sometimes would be like a whole roasted turkey with two triscuits, you know, in between two triscuits. Yeah. And they so they would do it that big. One person got me a ti the tiniest turkey sandwich. And then the best of all, I think, was a pinata shaped like a turkey sandwich. Mm -hmm. And when you hit it, what came out was smaller hand-drawn pictures of pinatas and tiny turkey sandwiches. That wow, was kind of the most says, meta one, you know? That's wow. But yeah, and then now I ask for fresh flowers and then some dead or dying flowers to remind me of my imminent mortality. Nice. And uh, emergency underwear. <laughs> what? On like your right every, every city. Yeah, every single city, yeah. You never know, Steve-O. You of all people. Yeah. You know that emergency underwear can come into can uh, come in handy. I, 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 um, he likes plaid boxers. I, I only wear... I wear special underwear for the show also. Well, I, I always wear plaid boxers because there's just some times when your butthole's itchy. You know, you don't want to itch it, but your butthole's just on its hands and knees, just yeah. begging you to just itch it. Just begging for the itch. <laughs> yeah. And the then butt when is it, butt begging. Right. And then <laughs> when you itch, you, when you itch it, you, you end up what's called a, a skid mark. You, that's why you have a... Yeah, I'm familiar they, with it. They call Carlons. it... This, yeah, it's they a call it, name. <laughs> <laughs> they call it a skid mark. And uh, I find that the plaid boxers... Uh, most effectively disguise the skid mark. You know, you wouldn't even know it was there. You should do uh, <laughs> underwear with skid marks all over it. That's like the pattern. Yeah. It's like, what? what are you skid talking mark about? underwear. <laughs> and that's something you could do, but I could yeah. Imagine if I was like, I'm also staring at underwear. It looks like you wipe shit on it. <laughs> so it's called skid mark brand underwear. That's not a bad idea. Yeah. It's not a bad idea at all. <laughs> it's like coasters yeah. with like little lines of coke as the art designer. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. It should be good too, but right now these skid marks 
is healthier for your fan base. Right. So skid mark, you can make it look really realistic, too. All the d different skid marks, like. I saw you did that Mike Dyson, Iron Mike ah, Dyson rad, drop. Dude. Yeah. You and I should do it. We shouldn't tattoo skid mark <laughs> diarrhea <laughs> underwear on our bodies, but. We should right. do a collab, then drop that skid mark. It's only yeah. going to be, you know, five yeah. hundred available. Now, now you don't have tattoos. Do you, do you have I tattoos? do. I have one tattoo. Wow. And it's. I have a story about it. Actually, I'll just tell the story. So I went to get this tattoo, and Kate, that's my wife. Kate doesn't really. She's not into tattoos, and I wasn't really either. But I wanted to get one. I thought of this idea. So it's such a great idea. I thought. And what I did was where my vaccine band-aid was for the second vaccine shot. I just had a tattoo artist like darken freckles around it mm -hmm. in that exact shape. So unless you say this is what the tattoo is, nobody can tell that it's a tattoo. Okay. So that was pretty clever. Okay. So then I um, I research to try and get a tattoo artist. I find this girl that I really like in San Diego. And I emailed her, and I was, because I talk about this, right now in my stand-up, I'm talking about being famous and my kind of famous, which you've sort of touched on a lot in your work. And so I kind of, I, I emailed her, I described the tattoo, and I said, Wait, Help get, me with that, you mean being famous, but only kind of famous. Is being famous in the way that I am famous. So you're okay. famous in a very different way for me, but also completely different from everybody else. Okay. So my kind of famous is very strange. It's bad. It's good. It's all. So I talk about all of that, and um, but also you know the ways that being famous are good is you people will give you. So I email to I email this woman. I describe that tattoo, and she emails me, and I say, please give me a call sincerely, T.J. Miller. Then she writes back, and she's like, I don't do those types of tattoos. And I write back. I said, I don't think you understand what I'm saying. It's you know, it's darkening. Just give me a call, and I'll explain it sincerely, T.J. Miller. And then she wrote back. She goes, No, no, no. I'm all booked up. You can forget it. You know. Good luck. So I emailed back one more time, but this time I'm T.J. Miller. God damn it. <laughs> better than that, I sign it sincerely, T.J. Miller from the Emoji Movie. Okay. And so right away she writes back immediately. She goes, This is so random, but if this is really T.J. Miller. Call me, and I did, and she recognized my voice because my voice is very recognizable. Right. So I was the music next man, and all kinds of other things. And she was, her kids are a big fan of Big Hero Six and How to Train Your Dragon. So I go, but as I'm in the chair, and she's got the needle in my arm, she's like, I totally thought you were trolling me. And I was like, what? What do you mean? She goes, I just, I thought you were fucking with me. I thought there's no way you're TJ Miller. And I was like, why would I? She's like, that's what I thought. Like, why would anyone <laughs> pretend to be T.J. Miller? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I pretend not to be. Um, so that's, that's your go-to from the Emoji movie? I mean, all yeah, of the I, list of stuff that you that, that was That was what I thought. I'm like, wow, so the, the Emoji yeah, movie. Like, I'm Steve-O huh? from TV the movie. It's like, you would, that, that's not your well, best Well, the Emoji before. movie yeah. was a big deal. Well, it's, you know, kids love it, but for me, it's what's funniest. Like, for a long time, Yogi Bear 3D was, that's what I wanted people to introduce me with wow. uh, when I went on stage. And for me, stand up comedy is like so much more <coughs> important to me than anything else in terms of comedy. What do you think? I love it. It's great, right? I want more of it. Um, you got to have it. And, um, and so. For a long time, it was, ladies and gentlemen, from Yogi Bear 3D, T.J. Miller, which is the best film that I've ever been in. It was my best performance. I gave myself a Critics' Choice Award for Best uh, best Supporting Actor in a Talking Bear Comedy. So, um, that's a children's movie. Yogi Bear 3D? Yeah. I hope so. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, so, then... After a while, that got like a little stale to introduce me. So then I did this movie, Transformers for Age of Extinction. It's an indie film. It did really well in Sundance. I don't know if you guys have seen it. Yeah, Transformers? That's like Michael Bay. Michael Bay. Yeah, it's, no, no. It's Michael uh, Bay. Michael Bay. And it's um, it's Michael Bay. Michael Bay does and not it's Mark make Wahlberg. indie movies. No, it's great. It's only two hours too long. You're going to love it. You'll see <laughs> it. And, uh, and so then I started introducing, having people introduce me like that. And then after a while, that guy kind of, so then the Emoji movie, they came to me to ask me if I would do it. And I was like, of course. I went and I looked at all the boards and saw it. And I thought it would be so great. And they also would let me do a pass on the script, all this stuff. But I did it because it's so funny to be in a movie called Yogi Bear 3D, where the 3D is in the name of the movie. 
Yeah. And then the Emoji Movie just tells you what it's about. Right. Like I just thought that was so dumb that they'd be like, "What movie are you in? The Emoji Movie? What's the, what do you think? What do you think the, like, what, what's the elevator pitch for the Emoji, the emoji movie? movie? Yeah. Like okay, I'll give it to you. Ready? Yeah. It's a movie about emojis. <laughs> Did you like that? Was that too fast? I mean... What floor are we going to in the elevator? If it's uh, a 10-floor ride, then I'll tell you this. Yeah, give, give me a, a synopsis. Movie about money. emojis. The main character in Emoji goes through an entire character arc where he ends up being a different emoji. Wow. Take okay. my money. Emoji movie. Take my money, yeah. please. How much do you want for this movie? Um, What's the it money? made $100 million domestic, so it was a huge success. We hold the record for the fastest animated movie development to production to premiere. Wow. So we did it in like a year. It's all emojis. It's all emojis. Yeah. You know, so the animation looks pretty good. But so that was sort of funny for me. So that's my kind of joke. And then she was like, okay, this can't be the real TJ Miller. And then as soon as I said emoji movie, she was like, maybe it is. And then it was. Yeah. I was not, you know, I wasn't I thought, pretending to be TJ Miller. Who would? Why would anyone do that? <laughs> right. Who would do that? I, I thought that when you said she thought you were trolling her, that it was the tattoo idea that she thought she was being trolled with. Like yeah. who would? Who would want freckles darkened? Like well, you're trolling me. What's hilarious is that that's the dumbest idea for a tattoo of all time, for sure. But even more preposterous would be pretending to be T.J. Miller. <laughs> right, okay. That's even more ridiculous than that tattoo idea. All so, right. yeah, I mean, so that's my only tattoo. And uh, I don't think I'm going to get another one. I'm going to get it darkened when I'm filming my next special in San Diego on uh, in March. Okay. But how many tattoos do you have? Do you even know? It's a subjective number. I mean, like uh, some have grown, you know, like... Some have been removed. Some have been removed. Have you had a lot removed? No, I, I used to have uh, my knuckles said shit and fuck. Yeah, you can, there's, there's a time when you kind of grow out of that one. <laughs> I think. You know what I never grow out of is being an attention whore. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't. But all of this attention whoring that I've been doing in New York City to promote my book has kept me so busy that my hair is growing out of my face. I'm telling you, man, do I have this grace double all over or what? Tuh, man, I'm hurting for a shave. And thank God I've got my Harry's shaving products to take care of it. And you know, normally when my stubble is this grown out, like I would be afraid of using a, a, a razor because it might tug on it. It's not my Harry's, baby. They stay sharp. These five blade razors are not only incredible but they're affordable no gimmicks no nonsense no it doesn't vibrate it doesn't light up it's just what i need and it's what i love man i've been using harry's for years and i'm never turning back plus man when i go after this it's gonna glide right through it zoom zoom no problem and you should try it because they got this starter kit with the five blade razor, the weighted ergonomic handle, the travel case to protect the razor, the foaming shave gel, and the travel size body wash. All of this put together, the starter kit is worth 16 bucks by their measure. I told you they're affordable high quality but this $16 value starter kit is yours for only three dollars man these people are generous to the listeners of the wild ride podcast and don't look a gift horse in the mouth they're offering you this good of a deal you jump on it by going to harrys.com slash stevo again for this starter kit with all this great stuff, everything you need, $16 value, it's all yours for just three bucks if you go to harrys.com slash stevo. Jump on that deal, and let's get back to talking about these dumb tattoos. Right. You I, know, uh, when you're giving your first <laughs> sort of uh, christening, baby christening, and you're the ones who right. are doing it, or <laughs> circumcision, I guess, right. you know, <laughs> You don't really want to say shit fuck. Right. Why did you get that book? Um, I went <laughs> That's a follow-up question. Why in the fuck did you end up doing that, <laughs> Steve-O? 
Uh, I mean, I was intensely proud. These were coming, right. You know, I, I don't. He's I, like, shut the fuck up, you <laughs> stupid asshole. <laughs> you know, and, then, and then he apologizes in the most sincere way five minutes later. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, so I'm kind of the opposite, and people I think think that I am. Um, I think they just want me to insult them because so many things that I've done in Deadpool, it's just the whole run of me insulting Ryan Reynolds. All through Silicon Valley, I was always insulting. So I think people think if they yell stuff out, they'll... And it happened more, it's happened less now that I've become, I guess, more famous, or people are just like, don't, that, that's not okay to rough. Used to happen all the time, every single show. But now, yeah, if people yell, they kind of want to be involved. And I'm very quick, because I started out as an improviser, I'm quick to go into the crowd to talk to people. And that's what's so weird about this special, Dear Jonah, because I did this, I have these specials that are coming out that are all completely improvised stand-up. So it's where the audience gives suggestions for names of jokes, and that wow. becomes my set list. And then I, they, I have a projector and they throw up the name, it could be whatever, like Karl Marx farts or something like that. And the first <laughs> time I see it is the first time the audience sees it, and then I turn around and do a joke, completely improvised right off of that. And I finish, they throw up the next joke. And so I started as an improviser. That's really fun for me. Are you committing yourself to putting this out, like regardless of how it goes? Or yeah, are totally. You... Well, and what you do is you get rid of the stuff that absolutely didn't work. But yeah, you have to have some things that show you fumbling and not doing well. Right. But for the most part, the audience is just amazed that you can even do it in general, that you right. can present something. So when it's really funny, then they're just like, what the fuck just happened? I mean, I'm amazed. And, um, but I do a lot of crowd work. I speak with the audience. I'll t I talk about my day. I have a lot of stuff online that's kind of, I show up in Winnipeg and just talk about Winnipeg and what happened that morning. And it's just, it's all improvised. The audience loves it. So I love to throw that stuff up. But in Dear Jonah, the strangest thing happened, which is, so when you film a special, you know this, when you film a special, you have to do two different shows, usually right. two different shows, a theater or something. And then you pick the best one and then use that as the foundation. And you and patch up pick. any little exactly. issues with the other show. So I figured out a way to shoot these specials so that they're television quality, but I can shoot four shows or five shows. So I did four shows in Nashville and the first show went pretty well. We're like, ah, we don't have it at all. It's just me warming up. And then the second show, you know, Late Show Friday, sometimes you're like, oh, this is gonna be a disaster. People are yeah. so drunk. And also, it is the worst. And people are so drunk uh, in Nashville. So I said, if I get out there and they're just a mess, I'm just gonna riff and we'll have that on. And the director said, no, 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 honestly, we don't really have it at all. So just do the exact special again. And hopefully we get a couple of good things, then we'll, we'll bank those. I said, we'll see what happens. So I go out and I start performing and it's the best audience. It's such an amazing audience. I'm like, how is this possible? That sec Somehow it felt like these people had drank perfectly. <laughs> they were absolutely all professional drunks, which is, I guess, Nashville. It's either a bachelorette party or just pro drunkards. And I'm performing and I'm like, this is it, this is special. I mean, this, this is the audience that I want for the special. And then this fucking guy in the front row starts just talking. And I was like, oh, why is this guy heckling? And it, it was weird. You know how when you're really drunk, but you have audience members that are drunk and they're not trying to be mean or anything. They're just drunk in a way that they forget there's other people and it's just Steve-O and them in their living room and they're listening. And so they'll just talk to you. And so he started doing that. He was like, oh, that's true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, I'm good, that was good. And I was just like, God damn it. So I ignored him <laughs> for a little while. Because he was fucking up the special. I mean, he's talking, it's he messing with my he was front he was frontest row. He was the most front. <laughs> he was practically on the fucking stage. Really, his he could have leaned his chin down and he was on the stage right there. So I was like, all right, what am I gonna do? I've gotta just talk to him. I'm gonna try and shut him down, and then I'm gonna move on, you know, and then get back into what I wanna do, which is film this special. That I it was going to be called the pandemic special to show people what I was doing during the pandemic. You right, know? and it, it's it's particularly difficult when you're doing crowd work on camera to pull in anything from another show because you've got different audience members. And for the rest of the show, if you call back to that person, you can't 
you can, you can only use that thing in right. that show. So yeah, you're totally fucked, kind of. So I said, all right, I'm just going to talk to him, get it done, and move on. And so he's right in the front row. So he's wearing cargo pants. And I go, oh, you wearing cargo pants? What kind of cargo you got? What do you, what do you, what do you haul on? What's your freight, you know? And he starts to talk about cargo pants, and he's like, I, 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 I just like cargo pants, even though I don't keep anything in them. And so it's immediately clear he's developmentally challenged. This guy is like, you know, yeah. he is not, he's not a drunk heckler. Let me put it that way. That is not what was happening. Right. And so there's this moment where he finishes that thing and you can feel the audience is like, Ooh, what is TJ going to do? <laughs> Because it's a real moment. Am I going to... Lots of comedians would just be like, oh, 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 you know what I, mean? I like cargo pants. You could absolutely have done that. But that's not me. And so I just took a beat, and I just turned to the audience, and I'm like, I want all of you to know that I am not going to make fun of him at all. And they just erupt. Everyone's laughing and clapping and stuff because then everyone can just relax, and this, this kid can relax too. And then throughout the show, he starts to come back in. I like ask him some questions, I do this. At one point, he just, I say something, it's quiet, and he's like, ha, hilarious, it's hilarious. And I was like, it is hilarious. <laughs> and as the show goes on, he becomes more and more incorporated into it until by the end of the show, by the end of the special, he's kind of the star of it. And so I changed the name of it from the pandemic special to Dear Jonah, because it sort of ended up being a love letter to this guy who I'm sure, and he's the hugest fan of mine. He just loves it, and he says that a couple times in the show, and the, the closer of the show, I involve him, and there's this guy who's a total idiot, fucking this guy named Trevor, which is the perfect name for this dude when you see the special, and you know, I mean, it's you got to see it, but it's unlike anything else because no one's ever had something like this happen. And even if they did, they would cut it out probably. Mm -hmm. Right. Or they would move away from it, right? Which is hilarious because now there's this whole ableist thing and they're saying you can't say spaz and all those sorts of things. And so a lot of people said to me, well, you shouldn't, you should probably cut that out. I was like, why would I cut that out? That's ableist. That's not including. I wanted to include him in the conversation. He was the show. He ended up being the best part of the show. And so that was the craziest experience for me of a heckler. Right. Because I thought I was being heckled, and it turns out being something completely different. And so throughout the whole 45 <laughs> minute special, you're just like, you kind of halfway through start to be like, where's Jonah? I want to see Jonah do some stuff again. And then he does. It's amazing. Yeah, if only I had hecklers like that. I've just got absolute shitheads. Oh, I've got those too. <laughs> and then you just got to tear them apart. And I get some really entitled white women yelling shit and getting upset at me. That's actually in the special also. But um, yeah, usually you got to shut them down and make fun of them. Right. My technique always is to like contextualize their behavior, like recontextualize. So somebody will be like, wasn't that funny or something like that? I'm like, God, you would be a great dad. You know what I mean? Somebody comes back with their, look, dad, yeah. look what I drew today. Well, not that good. I get to give you a beer and get the fuck out of the way of the television. <laughs> so you kind of, you know, you get it right. from that angle, sort of. But this was a great example of how I do crowd work, but it also kind of shows that I'm a good guy. I think, you know, there's some there people who are like, oh, he seems like an asshole. And it's really, you can tell in the special that, like, all I want is for this to go <clears throat> well for this kid. And, yeah. for every, and it's, it ends up being so great. He showed up at 4 p.m. He was the first person in line. Biggest fan. And that's why he was sitting this close to yeah. the stage. Because he got there. And I, I thought he was with his family. And I later found out that they were just people at his table who had befriended him. That his family had dropped him off. And that he had seen me before. Found this out afterwards. And he uh, was in the back of the room, and he liked it so much that he decided in his mind, I like him so much, I'm going to sit as close as possible as I can. And they also, the, the uh, venue, Zanies, the comedy club, mm -hmm. they said um, that he asked, can I get closer to the stage? How, how actually physically close can I get to the stage? So it's amazing. It's like such yeah. a bizarre thing that happened. And... That could have happened any single night of my life as a performer, any of the hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows I do, and it just happened to be on the night that I had a six-camera shoot and was filming the audience, so we caught everything from him. 
It's pretty. It's pretty special. Pretty awesome. Yeah. And, people say they tear up at the end of it. Some people are like, it's almost because it's like emotional at the end. You're like, cool. God, this it. is great. Yeah, you gotta yeah. check it out. Say so that that that's epic. You said when uh, you walked in and we had not yet started recording that uh, that you have a story about us meeting. And let me tell you that when I, when I hear <laughs> this, when I when when I hear that somebody has uh, an old story about meeting me, it gives me great anxiety. Really? <laughs> kind yeah, of because you're really nice. You're because, like, I, you just came up to me. You go, I bet you can't suck your own dick. And then you started <laughs> sucking your own dick. And as I tried to do it, you hit me over the head with like a sack of potatoes, <laughs> and it forced my dick into my own mouth. And then I found Wait, out that your <laughs> then I found out that your dick was prosthetic, and you were just joking. But I had sucked my own dick by the end of the night meeting you. So you wow. don't need to have any anxiety. Where was this in Vegas? <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. So uh, what actually happened was we and my wife Kate was with me. Yeah, and I would, and I would just friends. say I say that because um, yeah, it gives because you anxiety. There, I, I, I get anxiety because there have been different versions of me, and and if you met a certain version of me, then the story is going to be horrifying. I think that's true. I always <laughs> wish that I had met nitrous oxide you. Okay. Because <laughs> I was a huge nitrous oxide enthusiast. Were you? For years. We did, I did the Critics' Choice Awards. This was a long time ago. And I was doing so much nitrous at that point that I would go on live television, do what I was doing, then run back, look over my notes, hit a couple of nitrous cartridges, and then go back on stage. Because my joke about nitrous is it only lasts like 20, 30 seconds be the best thing to get pulled over doing. Because the cops, like, if you've been doing nitrous and you're like, oh, yeah, a little bit, but what are you going to do about it? Because now it's over. (laughs) That's it. It's all gone. Right. It only Um, lasts 20, 30 seconds, or as long as you keep inhaling it. (laughs) Right, exactly. Well, and that's why after Critics' Choice Awards, we went and we went to the Bel Air, and Kate and I just partied. We know each other since college. We've known each other for like 20-some years. And so we just, sometimes we just go into that mode. And we just partied, and we were so excited. And when we woke up the next day, there were like a thousand whippet cartridges because mm-hmm. we had bought the hundred packs, you know. So we just had <laughs> you gone guys are like the same hundreds people. and hundreds and hundreds that night. <laughs> and we were just joking. There was a whole like bar. I don't know how we ordered it, but it was a full bar on a room service cart. Like I guess we just been like, bring it all, yeah. damn it, bring every last one of them. And we just and so Kate woke up. And she was like, oh, man, we got to stop doing nitrous. And, like, as she said that, I was like, oh, I found another 100 pack. And she's like, after that, <laughs> got to stop doing nitrous right after we finished that. But I think we we met you in incredibly uh, grateful, amiable, authentic steve Because cool. you really quickly kind of said – Oh man, I'm a huge fan, and I just I love doing stand up, and it's kind of new to me. But it's it was a while ago. It was at the Laugh Factory. Okay. And so I kind of I thought that was amazing, and it was a great moment for me because you know there's a lot of people that didn't start off as stand up comics and they started doing stand up comedy, like a Jeremy Piven or sure. a lot of these YouTube guys. And a lot of comics are were just like, oh, God, yeah, sure, you're doing stand-up. But the way that you talked about it, just in our brief interaction, I realized, no, this guy has a lot of respect for the form. And then later, subsequently, as I sort of heard your stuff and came to understand, I realized you really were a storyteller, but you were also kind of doing that as stand-up and doing stand-up within that. And I feel like I saw all that on you, like in you right away. And then you were so nice to Kate. And then you talked to Kate's cousin, Giselle, who's just fucking awesome. She's like a goth mom right now. (laughs) And she and her husband's so great, too. And she's a huge fan of yours. And so you blew her fucking mind because she expects you so nervous to meet you. And she expects you to be like, oh, it's nice to meet you. And yeah, I'm Steve-O and I got to go. And you just straight up stood there for 10 minutes kind of answering questions and asking her about her life and all this stuff. And she'll, she'll never forget that. I mean, it was the coolest thing. Cool, and that's man. the other thing I noticed about you. I was like, yeah, this guy will definitely take 10 minutes of his time to permanently alter somebody's life in terms of their stories and who they, you know, because there's a thing, never meet your heroes. I just saw you kind of being like, if you meet me and I'm your hero, you're going to get as much of me as I can give you. Which wow. sometimes is a bad thing. 
Yeah. Sometimes that can probably get you in trouble because you're such a nice dude. You'll sort of give almost too much yourself. That happens to me a lot. And it can get you in trouble. But for the most part with fans, because we've had some crazy evil fans, but we also have heard so many people come to me and to Kate and say, it's just so amazing meeting you guys or I met you. You you know, you performed at our college and afterwards, it's like 15 years ago, and afterwards I came up to you and I was like, what's up? And you were like, come on, let's fucking chug Dr. Pepper and eat sandwiches as fast as we possibly can. And they're like, I'll never forget that. So that was, that was I met that Steve-O. So what would you call that Steve-O? Different versions of you, uh, what was that one? That sounds like a, 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 a fresh... You know, restored Stevo, because uh, the, you know that the last episode of this podcast was with Wee Man, and I was discussing with him about He's how, yeah, I, I was discussing with him about how you know, despite the fact that we've been around for over twenty years, you know, kind of in the public eye, yeah, for sure, that having this this uh, most recent Jackass movie come out, it really kind Which of was great. By the way, it's crazy. Thank you. It re-energized the brand, and uh, and it really made it um, considerably more challenging to get around in public. You know, there's just more, like we, there's more energy around us. Before that, did you feel you could walk around and people wouldn't bother you? I mean, it, it, it's. He straight up goes no. <laughs> in L.A., yeah. In like. Nebraska Walmart. Fuck yeah, me. I mean, uh, like, yeah, of course. What would be interesting is that weird how you're famous in different ways in different places. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a challenge to get around in public for for 20 years, no doubt. But it's just been, I would characterize it as overwhelming as of late, and uh, and it makes um, it's just been more difficult. And it's it's uh, when there's more uh, energy, when there's more people, more you know, attention, it, it's harder to give everybody that special moment, you know, it's harder to give, and, and, and it's, it's, it's more like you, you get burned out, you're not a fresh version of yourself, and like when there's just so many people all the time, like, I, I've found myself getting kind of short, it's like, yes, I'll take a picture, but put it on selfie and hurry up, yeah. you know? Yeah, and you know, I do the same thing, it was so funny you mentioned that, because today I'm on the phone with Kate, I'm trying to get this fucking hot sauce here, because I forgot. So I've been doing nitrous uh, by the way, all morning. All morning. <laughs> I'm okay. trying that. I'm trying the fucking intense. Try right it. Here. Try it. Isn't this good with this? Chipotle's amazing. That's the stuff. But I love that one the best. Okay. Well, you Pepper. guys are hot hot sauce guys, right? So then there you go. We're sexy hot sauce guys, not hot. Yeah. Right. But did you read? Did you read the card from Kate? Just not because he said sexy hot sauce guys. Just read the card that's on the back. Kate wrote this. I didn't even tell her. Okay. Uh, good luck, hot pants. Don't sit in there. Because <laughs> <laughs> she loves the thing where you're going in the port. Uh, of the I love it. But yeah, I I was trying to talk to Kate and trying to get the hot sauce here, and um, you know this guy comes to hey, can I take a picture with you? And, I'm, and you do. You're kind of like yeah, yeah. Quickly, I'm on the phone with my wife, and they're like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And you're like, no, that's not what I need. I don't need you to be sorry. Yeah. That's just. And so I don't even ask them to put it on selfie. I take the phone. I know enough about Androids now, and I so I flip it, take the picture really quickly, and you don't want to brush them off, right? Because they're huge fans, but you also have your life, so it's a balance. It's right. A very specific right. balance. Do you do meet and greets at your shows? I used to before. Um, I used. You're very famous for those, by the way. It means a lot to me that I've developed a good reputation for the way I am on the road. And you know what deserves a good reputation? <laughs> My butthole. Because it's clean as a whistle. Because I keep it so. And I do that very, very effectively at home with my Tushy Bidet from Hello Tushy. Dot com. Now, if you've never used a bidet, let me tell you, you're out of your mind and your butthole's disgusting. Why? Because with my bidet from hellotushy.com, I twist that knob and I've got the most refreshing stream of water just power blasting my sphincter completely clean, like clean enough to eat off, okay? And it just feels so good when I get done blasting my butthole with that 
powerful stream of water coming out of my tushy bidet that I'd reach down and wipe my butthole just to dry it. And the satisfaction of looking at that toilet paper and seeing no poo-poo on it, it's meaningful. Plus, barely use any toilet paper because all I'm doing is just drying the water off of my perfectly clean poop chute. And that saves the environment because you're not just going through toilet paper like a maniac. No, 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 no. A nice refreshing blast from the tushy bidet. Now, here's the thing. Not only do I love this company, but it's my favorite sponsor of the Wild Ride podcast, HelloTushy.com, and they are generous as well. Go to HelloTushy.com slash Stevo for 10% off of your entire order and free shipping. (laughs) Plus, if you feel like really taking care of, of your pooper, then they got the Tushy Ace. I mean, dude, that's a whole seat. It warms up. It's got a remote control. You can warm up the water that you're blasting your butthole with. Like, they got the whole range of products, and they're my favorite products that I've ever promoted on this podcast. Again, hellotushy.com slash Devo. 10% off your whole order plus free shipping right now. Not to mention a butthole that is clean enough to eat off. So get to it. And let's get back to it. I used to for uh, um, before the pandemic. And then I kind of stopped. And now I sort of do them at will. Like mm-hmm. if I like an audience, then I'll mention it. I'll say, if you buy some hot sauce, I'll come take a picture with you. But you're famous for like... Every single Spending person so in the much entire... time with every single person. Yeah. They've said that. They've been like, the only person that does meet and greets as much as you is Steve-O. And then I think they said Carlos Mencia does them, but then also just goes into the audience. And but he also does three hours on stage. Right. Yeah. That's a different deal. At three yeah. in the morning, there's only I... four people left anyway. Yeah, exactly. I was on the comedy club it's circuit. I've heard all of this. <laughs> all three of us. Uh-huh. Uh, 11 years I was in comedy clubs. Every show, uh, the last thing I said was, I'm going to take a photo with every single one of you guys who wants one, the whole audience. And then um, since the pandemic, I've graduated to theaters. And now it's like, dude, a thousand people, I can't do that. Yeah, so, uh, so yeah, we we just do like a, a smaller group of... Uh, meet and greet it looks like you gotta buy the meet and greet pass and then I do all those people. well and you know what's interesting about that is that some people are like ah oh, man you used to do it's like no cause if you're if you if it's, the person is paying $80 for the meet and greet and knows there's only gonna be 10 people or whatever then that's important for them because basically what they're paying for is like I wanna guarantee time for my wife to meet you Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to impress my girlfriend. I mean, or this is my the Christmas present to my husband. Right. So I want him to have some time with you. So there's a good aspect of that too. Right. You know, it's not just like oh, he's charging an arm and a leg to meet him. But yeah, I mean, you know, that's I don't know that that is kind of what uh, that's the conundrum for guys like you and me. I think because you want to give the person everything, right. but you can't give so much of yourself. That I also thought it was interesting. I mean, I'm not wearing a hat or anything, but do you just walk around without sunglasses and a hat on or anything? Yeah, because that's what you were doing this morning. So that must be tough too, because it's so recognizable. Like, I, I could wear glasses and a hat. Doesn't I, I, I could wear full clown makeup? I'm still going to get recognized. You know what? That's actually two things that you just brought up that I wanted to talk to you about. One. You get recognized by your voice a lot, yeah. right? So then the same thing. So Order the pandemic didn't do shit. Right. Because you and I were in the people like, is that Steve-O? And then you talk, right. it's like, boom. For sure. And then the other thing I was going to talk to you about is that you used to be a clown. You right. started out as a clown. And I went to circus school in, like, Paris, France. And I also, I'm a juggler. I know. We, we, un- we understand. We're, we're told that you juggle during your stand-up. Yeah. I have a special coming out next year called Philosophy Circus. And there's, yeah, there's like juggling, there's terrible ventriloquism, somebody in the audience plays the trombone. Like, it's like very circus. And this I is already circus. shot? Yeah, sorry. Wow. I shot two hour long specials in three weeks, two completely separate specials. Because I was like, we gotta get these done and then move on to the San Diego special and get that ready. I gotta stop preparing with to shoot specials that I'm ready to shoot. 
Um, but I love circus. That's why I love Jackass so much because it has a lot of elements of circus. And when I read that about you, I was like, oh, that makes perfect sense. You yeah. Know? Because circus is like, don't think, just love, just laugh, just be amazed. Just, yeah. And that's what I love about circus. And I really always thought of Jackass like a similar to a circus and nobody ever brings that up because they just don't think of that connection but that's great because you are a clown I'm a clown also but we're sort of not traditional clowns right. not what you would think of when you think of clowns for sure so, so uh, <clears throat> what what kind of juggling do you do you juggle balls so I can do that I can juggle up to five balls but in wow the, uh, five the, the leap from four to five is a substantial leap and they call it the black belt of juggling as if you can do five then you're like a master juggler what can you do what, I can, can do, do five four like when you're juggling four balls, all that means is you're just doing two, two in each, each hand. hand. It's an optical illusion. It's well, like magicians know yeah. that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're juggling four balls. <laughs> 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 you don't tell anybody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you alternate. Oh, so yeah, that exactly. So it looks. It's an optical illusion. Right. And you can cascade them quick, but why? Right. Who cares? Everybody watching is like, oh my god. But yeah, jump to five is really different. Five is. A, you can do five. I've never gotten anywhere near. I had to just do it. I was actually at a circus camp as a counselor teaching stilt walking and juggling. And every day I would just go and practice for like five hours, six hours. How long can you sustain five balls? For a while. I can get through the pattern for like, yeah, for like a couple minutes. But not, I couldn't do it in perpetuity. I'm going to drop one eventually. Right. So what you do when you juggle five is you hit it right until it's impressive and then you catch them. And you're like, I'm done. I could have done it forever. But you could <laughs> not have. Uh, but I, what I juggle is I juggle, you know, flaming. T- I can juggle torches, knives. Can you pass clubs? Of I course. can pass clubs, yeah. But my favorite thing and what's in the special is cigar boxes. Okay. So those are the three blocks that you mm-hmm. move around. Sure. Those are really cool. I'm very good at those. I'm actually a member of the Magic Castle in Los Angeles. Wow, nice. Because of that, because W.C. Fields popularized that. And then I can also do these things called shaker cups, which is like yeah. cups that stack, and you do all that. So those are the actually the two types of, um, that's exactly how you do it. Yeah. Like that. Same way you would jack off a bunch of guys. Just <laughs> <laughs> Huge necks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and so um, those are the ones that I find really interesting. But in the philosophy circus, I juggle glow-in-the-dark balls. I tell a, a scary story to everybody. And then uh, I do – it's so bizarre. But I do a ventriloquist dummy bit at the end of Dear Jonah. And then just because I I had to change it to that for the pandemic, then um, – I did a, there's a ventriloquist dummy bit at the end of Philosophy Circus. So it's really funny to me that when people say, when people see this next special after Dear Jonah, they're going to be like, is he going to start closing every special with a ventriloquist dummy thing? Is that like who he is? But it's not. It's just those two worked so well in these specials. So All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's crazy. So did you do, were you, did you not get into clown college for Ringling Brothers or you did? I did. You really did? Yeah, yeah. That's what I wanted to do after high school. It was they, tough to get in. They, it was a big deal. And they ended the program. I Correct. Think, right I graduated in 2000. I, I graduated in the last class ever, which was the class of 1997. So I, I was graduating in 99, and I would have applied in 98, but it was over. That's amazing. Yeah. And I'm so jealous of you for that thing alone. Yeah, it's Forget all the ball stuff. You went to... Paris to go to circus school. Yeah, so that's what I ended up having to do, but that was in college, and I got a, um, I got a scholarship to that. So I just had to get myself there. So you're like, fuck, I can't get in the Ringling Brothers Circus, so then you went to Paris. Yeah, So, but I would have rather done an American clown college. This was great, but mostly in Paris I learned stilt walking, and it was more like body movement. French Cirque du Soleil type yeah. shit. I wanted to just do like hit yourself on the head with a giant inflatable sledgehammer, fall down, get in a car. Like that, yeah. that American clowning I think is really interesting because it's more jackassy. Yeah. It's more Three Stooges a little bit, you know? Why did you get it? Why, I know you've talked about it before, but like you wanted to go in for the, the art of the circus. Why did I, you want to go into the circus? I had my heart set on becoming a crazy famous stuntman. You know, it started up. It started out as uh, skateboarding, led me to the video camera. Right. I was like, 
I'm not going to be a professional skateboarder. I'm not that good, but I love making videos. I just want to be crazy with my, if I just film really crazy crap with my home video camera, I want that to be my career. Yeah, yeah. Which is crazy because there was no precedent for that. And and yeah. uh, somehow we made I made it work. But um, the... Uh, the idea was like I was I'm gonna be a stunt man and and I wasn't getting any traction and then while living with my sister and my sister found out about clown college like right. like uh, it occurred to me I was like okay well maybe people will take me more seriously as a stunt man if I'm a trained circus professional it was like a sort of a means to an end I was trying to I only went to clown college to further my goal of becoming a famous, crazy, professional stuntman. So that was sort of your backdoor way into being a motorcyclist in the globe, or those stunt uh, people, it, kind it, of. If that was gonna be it, perhaps. I just wanted to be taken more seriously for lighting myself on fire at backyard keg parties. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> I love that. And the way to do that, the validation of your seriousness yeah. was the clown. Right, clown. yeah. I'm the only guy who went to clown college seeking legitimacy. I think that's exactly <laughs> right, for sure. Oh, my God, that's so funny. Yeah, do they teach I mean. you how to, like, act to the public? Like, you I mean, to be very, like, they, uh. Like, expression that's really good. Yeah. Where did you study? <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they broke it down. <laughs> They, they broke clown college down into like, you know, hour long classes that went throughout the day. So you had like an hour of dance class. You had what kind an of hour, uh, like whatever, like uh, all kinds of dance. You had uh, an hour right. of, uh, okay. of acrobatics, you know, an yeah. hour of skills, you know, an, an hour of a circus history. You know, you'd put on your makeup for, for an, it'd be an hour of makeup. Like um, every when, day you do this, yeah. So, so it's like class, but like the, the, wow, those are the classes yeah, it's that college. you take. Yeah, There's legit classes. We'd break for lunch for an hour. We'd go back to more classes. So can you uh, really dance? No. Now <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you, you you never you didn't. The only thing that you had to do uh, was to walk on stilts. You had to be a proficient stilt walker. Be, beyond that, it was just sort of an exercise in trying to to uh, just highlight your strengths. Yeah, find you, your clown. Right. right? You're trying yeah, to figure exactly. out what your clown was going to be. Right. Uh huh. Is That's, there like a defined different types of clown, like <clears throat> an archetype of clown? That yeah, you, for sure. What, but what but, kind of clown are you, or what kind of clown are you? Well, there's yeah. three distinct types of clown. There's, um, like, a, for lack of a better word, the the hobo clown, which is like Emmett Kelly. No, that's right. Yeah. You yeah. know, that, that, that's sort of its own kind of clown. And then there's the tramp. They call that sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. And then and then the other two uh, is the white face clown and the Auguste clown. And, and they base this on um, cartoon characters, like Tom and Jerry. There's, uh, like, one is, like, you know, Tom is the cat. He's, like, the dumb, like, runs into the wall. And Jerry's, like, the straight face, like, more kind of, like, clever. You know, like, in, in all the cartoons, there's mm -hmm. the, 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 the straight one and there's the dumb one that, like, crashes into the yeah. wall all the time. So I was the dumb one that crashes into the wall all the time. That's the, perfect. It's called the yeah. Auguste Clown. And then the white face clown is going to be like your Jerry. So when you see, like, a bunch of clowns acting out, all of them are acting out one of three different characters. Uh, in a traditional sense, yes. A version yes. of it is yeah. what they would sort of say. Is you'd say, okay, whatever. But finding your clown, your, yours would be like, there's also the archetype, the butthole burner. But and that's just someone who has their butthole burning the whole time, like ah, ah that type of thing. Yeah. Um, no, but you find kind of what are your strengths, like you were saying, right. and then you kind of plug that into what your clown would be. I, 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 I would say. And in different different countries, it's different. Russian clowns are different than French clowns, or different than American clowns. But it does all kind of come to those three. Yeah, I Whoa. would submit too that there's also like just straight skills clowns. You know, like you, you could be a clown, and just your deal is just that you're going to juggle the whole time. You think you can start a clown college school and teach all the classes? I wouldn't want to do that and Yeah, um, but you could. You could, right? I, I suppose I, I You could write a curriculum. I, I could, but uh, I, out of respect for the art, I don't think that I I, I think it would be interesting is for you to kind of teach stunt clowning. Perhaps. But, you know, but I, I think I, what I was just blown away by is that knowing that I can see so much of that in your work. 
And it's a way yeah. to kind of go back and look at his shit from the past and see the way he reacts to the camera and when he actually gets hurt, how he sort of expresses that. It's really, I mean, it's really, really interesting. Because I just, I didn't know that about you until just recently, once I found out that I was maybe coming on the podcast. And so I, I, we, I read that and it just clicked. I was like, of course he's a clown. That makes perfect sense. And that's, you know, coming from a clown, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I worked as a clown. Like that, that uh, my, my clown career afforded me the ability to not sell drugs for a living. Yeah. I went from, from selling uh, terribly short, underweight bags of weed to earning a legitimate living as a clown right up until the day that uh, I was shooting the Jackass series. Wow. Actually, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> I uh, washed off my clown makeup in the circus for the very last time within a half an hour of barfing up the goldfish in the iconic goldfish really? Jackass scene. Yeah. Oh my God. Knoxville and the MTV crew actually came to film me perform in the circus for what turned out to be my last ever performance in the circus. And uh, we went straight from there to. Do they have that footage? Yeah. Yeah, that footage. I, I think they even showed that footage in that uh, Demise and Rise documentary about my downward spiral into addiction. That would be cool footage to grab, your last footage as a clown. Yeah, they, they, I did a simultaneous fire breathing backflip off the top rung of a stepladder. Really? Yeah, I don't think I landed it particularly cleanly, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's so great. Yeah, I think in everything that I do, if you know that I'm a clown, then you see the movies I've been in, especially Ehrlich from Silicon Valley is a very clown, he's very Falstaffian. Oh my God, so he's I love it. sort of a buffoon, you know? And so you see him when he knocks stuff over, or the way that I interact with stuff, or talking about the Faya yogurt. It's just uh, all of that kind of comes back down to clown. And in that, I gained weight for that movie, and I created a clown wig with my hair. And so it, if you look at that character now, knowing that it's supposed to be a clown, you're like, oh, that makes perfect sense. Personally, I would have thought that uh, when you sent the email about the tattoo, that you'd say T.J. Miller from Silicon Valley. I know, but that's not funny. That would have okay. been like, hey, I'm a celebrity, you should let me right, in. Right, okay. So it's kind of, the irony of it is that, right. yeah, that I'm saying the Emoji Movie instead of Silicon Valley, instead of Deadpool, right, instead right, of right. Office Christmas Party, instead of the indie film Transformers for Age of Extinction. Right, it's pretty incredible. From <laughs> South by that, Southwest. That's, uh, that, that's quite the body of work, man. It's, uh, yeah, she's out of my league. There's yeah, a fair of really, out of my it's great, league. right? Cloverfield yeah. all the way to underwater. Yeah. yeah, I mean, dude, it's incredible. So, so you've got to have a you know a, a nice little nest egg t tucked away. The pandemic really screwed me. I, I, he probably didn't screw you guys at all. We well, started this podcast during the pandemic. Really? We, like I, I the during the pandemic, which was smart. Can you pass me some of my own hot sauce? Yeah. The really hot stuff. And then, and then we opened up a fulfillment house because the e-commerce started taking off. Yeah, we, uh, we're, we, we turned our attention more towards e-commerce and podcasting and even more like digital content. And uh, that allowed us to kind of expand our yeah. sure touring, touring mellowed out. Uh, but, but yeah, no, the pandemic worked well for us. Yeah, now, I kind of, I, yeah, we have a, a nest egg, but... Um, I really love performing, so I was wholly focused on performing. Right. And then the other stuff that I would do was acting, and so just everything kind of shut right, down. Right, right, right. It was such a bummer, but like I mentioned, Kate and I met in college, so it really was cool for the four months of lockdown here in New York because it was just like college. Like, all we did was get drunk, watch movies, not do homework, and try and score Percocet, but not be able to. <laughs> Guilt-free. It was exactly like that. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, but then I got back to touring almost as soon as I possibly could sure. before most other comedians. For did a while, you, it was just me and black comics that were playing the clubs. Did you um, do any of the drive-in movie theater shit? Or? No, I was thinking about it, and then, like, I also didn't do... I also didn't do any... Um, I didn't do, like, any... Zoom shows or anything like that. Oh, did God, yeah. of course not. Because I was like, I, I can't do that. So I did, did you do drive-in movie shows? Uh, I did not, no. I just didn't want, I, I hold so sacred that kind of real performance in the comedy club, in the theater, like right there and yeah. happening. And so I didn't want to mess with that other stuff. So no, I didn't do any of that right. stuff. Um, 
And that probably hurt me. I'm sure I could have made a little bit of money, but it just wasn't I mean, worth dude, it. They were charging obnoxious ticket yeah. prices for that drive-in business. For sure. But I just thought it, it, it almost kind of was sad, and it would just remind you of what was yeah. going on. So as soon as I could actually go to these places, I went. I could only – I talk about it in Dear Jonah. The only thing I could do, the only place I could perform were the crazy places that were like, this shit's not real. Right. So I performed in like um, – Phoenix was pretty. <laughs> Arizona was crazy, yeah. <laughs> crazy. Awesome. But yeah, you know, I was doing uh, Arizona and like um, Oklahoma was uh, pr- pretty doors yeah, open. Yeah, I, I, I talked about all this in the special. That's exactly right. But it was like Tampa, Florida, and like Greensboro, North Carolina, and Orlando, Florida, and like. Houston, Texas, and Naples, Florida, and like Port Charlotte, Florida, <laughs> everywhere the UFC went, Florida, <laughs> and Miami, Florida, yeah. and it was just basically all in Florida. But I went because I said to myself, never before has it been more important what I do, because people are so sad, sure. they're so scared, even if they're pretending not to be. So I went, but I would have to go do the shows, come back, totally quarantine for my wife. And then go get a COVID test like two days. Did you, did you ever get sick with COVID? Not during, not until Omicron. So okay. and I had two uh, fans on stage, two like blowing towards the audience. If they cough, the if they laugh the COVID at me. I go, <laughs> like, just blow it right back in their fucking face. <laughs> and um, Omicron, I only slept in the same bed. You, did you get sick on Omicron or? Yeah. But, oh, do you mean did I actually get sick? sick? Yeah. No, right. no symptoms at all. Right. So, it was, but I had vaccine and boosted, um, but for like many, many months, I only spent the night with Kate one night a week. And the wow. rest of the time, I was just jacking and attacking it downstairs. <laughs> I love that. That's watching Stevo videos. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, dude. So the uh, I remember like a few years ago, it was like like it, there was stories about you like crazy stuff, and I remember getting the impression like, man, it seems like. T.J. Miller is in trouble with alcohol or something like that. And uh, I was, like, I remember feeling, like, concerned for you. And then that concern just kind of, like, went away because there hasn't been any stories like well, that. Well, and what's interesting, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this probably in March, but I have a brain condition. He is not kidding about the brain condition. Wow, is this about to get intense. Plus, the train incident. I mean, I think everybody heard about it. It was awkward to bring it up, but I had to. My journalistic integrity would have been shot if I didn't bring up the train incident. I had to. Much like I have to stay hydrated or I'm going to die. So the coolest way that you can possibly stay hydrated and save the environment at the same time is to drink liquid death mountain spring water. Liquid death sparkling mountain spring water. Liquid death flavored sparkling water. I mean, what's great about this company is not just that the water is so great, but the water comes in infinitely recyclable tall boy cans, which are designed to look like beers. Plus, the company hates plastic. Liquid death, that's the whole reason they're called liquid death. They want to bring death to plastic. Why? Because plastic is destroying the world. We know that. Infinitely recyclable aluminum is not destroying the world. And that's why these cool beer-looking tall boys of liquid death mountain spring water are the coolest, the healthiest, and the best for the environment. And you can get them online without paying anything for shipping. Water's pretty heavy, and shipping it costs a lot, but not for you if you go to liquiddeath.com slash Stevo. Plus, you know you're helping me out. You're, you're helping me out if you do that, and you're helping the world out if you do that. You're helping yourself out if you do that. So let's do that. Go to liquiddeath.com slash Stevo. For all of your water and merch, the whole order, no shipping. You don't pay anything for shipping. Man, what a deal. Jump on it. And let's talk about this guy's brain. And I just Oh, that's right. You had you had brain surgery. I had brain surgery and they took out a golf ball sized piece of my brain. Mm. And it was from my right frontal lobe. 
And I was born with an AVM, which is an arteriovenous malformation. And it's just a malformed part of your brain that never really develops. It's just a mess of arteries and veins that you don't use. But it is, um, it's prone to hemorrhaging. It's like more fragile than the rest of your brain. But what's weird, and again, I just didn't talk about this for a long time because I didn't want to make it a part of my identity, I guess was the reason I didn't, or I didn't want to be honest with myself that I was brain damaged, or as my neuropsychologist says, uh, I had a traumatic brain injury. Oof. Um, Do you know what the injury was? So it wasn't. You're born with it. Uh, okay. So, yeah, birth was the injury. <laughs> the worst of all, because you never recover from it. Right. Um, and so... Um, and so I, what happens with the brain is, because I don't have the same amount of brain matter as the two of you, the rest this is the elasticity of the brain. It's such an amazing organ. Um, all the other parts of my brain picked up the slack, and so I seem, act, and think as if I'm a regular person. Like right now you got, but what's different is I'm prone to mania. And so um, what somebody who is bipolar feels, I don't feel the depression side of that but I can tip my way into the mania. Do you get manic at all? Yeah, sometimes, things? and when I do, it's fucking creepy as hell, dude. It's crazy, and so Do you know I what think, is happening? Um, it's hard to tell until you're in it, and then when you're in it, it's you're so far gone that you're just like, yeah. okay, this is amazing, my mind has reached a different, pr this is the greatest right. idea I've ever had in my life. I'm 100%. Gonna this. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna work on the computer while I'm doing this thing, and I'm gonna be on. No, I gotta write, I gotta write. So then you write like 50 pages, 100 pages, and then you stop, you're like, okay, I'll get back to this. But I gotta be making food while I'm doing it. It's just, it's so, I have never done cocaine, but I, people say it's like that, but it's not. Because because you're not on drugs, there's no way for you to be like, maybe it's the drugs. There's I, none of that. I had a, like a, a surgery recently. The one where I said I was the highest I've been. Like that yeah, yeah, I just saw that video. That, yeah. that triggered some crazy mania in me. Like, but uh, you weren't, I didn't see, I've seen it other sides before and I, I, you were fucked up, but it wasn't like, I think it was just no sleep fucked up. Like I didn't see anything well, red flag so, about it. So that's the big thing. And this is what you heard and, and said, what you was like something where you were on a train on or something. So I had a manic episode on the train and what happens is because of my condition, I have to get eight or nine hours of sleep a night. Oh wow! And so that, if I don't sleep for an entire night, it's very dangerous. And the other thing that's dangerous is combination. So five hours of sleep, having a bunch of drinks, being dehydrated, right? Smoking pot that's too strong keeps me up. I only get three hours of sleep. Then all those things can kind of, I start to get my feet in mania. And what I've talked to my neuropsychologist about recently, like in the last week or two, is that I have to just be honest with myself that mania is fun. It can be fun. And so it's sort of addictive in that way where you're like, maybe I'll have another shot and so just stay up a little bit longer and see if I could just, uh -huh. just get there. And then it's like, and then it goes, 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 goes. Mania is your drug of choice. Kind of, yes. And the way to get there is lack of sleep. Um, also, if you have extreme um, emotional swings, things that are happening like that, that can also trigger it. And that's what happened on the train, is that I had been going, I had been totally sleepless. I had this whole situation where this, uh, you know, it just, I, I had the internet absolutely attacking me. And I had it feeling like the world, so I was gonna spin out no matter what. And the problem is the way that I spin out, you used to be like this, I'm sure also, was to kind of turn to drugs and alcohol to kind of mollify that, like, ah. And that, instead of like making me be like, oh, yeah. uh, gasoline on crazy. the fire. And, and so then what happened was I had a manic episode on the train where <coughs> I sort of believed that this woman was dangerous, and which translates to other like, well, women can be dangerous and women that you don't know can do awful things and all this kind of, so that was all in my brain. Da, da, da. And um, and then I thought, New Yorker, I'm very proud of living in New York City. I was like, well, if you see something, say something. So I want to be a good New Yorker. And so I saw something, I said something, and I wanted to let you guys know, if it's not anything, it'll be something, okay? <laughs> oh, it'll be something. For a while, it'll be everything. Uh, but that, in my mind, it was all real. It's all real that I'm yeah. helping, that this woman deserves, that we've call this out and make sure that she's not being dangerous and all this stuff. 
And so there's a misunderstanding with the federal government. They eventually dismissed it because they understood for sure. They're like, okay, if this is where he can get to, I had evaluations by all these doctors. But what it did that was great is I found this neuropsychologist who explained to me, you had this surgery in 2010 and they didn't have the thing that you needed. It didn't exist then. What I needed was called um, cognitive remediation. And it's where you go back and you teach yourself to do the things that other people do cognitively um, without thinking about it. Downregulate? I don't know. What is that? It's just like talking yourself down in a healthy manner. I know we haven't used that like like I don't I don't garbage. have like if I get frustrated I'm just like Ugh, and I had to, like normal people are just like okay cool it's not that big of a deal but it, I'm, I don't have that there would be that it's also things like looking at your schedule for the next day or like um, what are some other examples of it just like like looking at me this is all real looking in the mirror and seeing, do I have physical signs of being tired? Because I never feel tired. Oh I my God, I, I feel never. tired. I can Most sleep. Most of the time, he's like. I'm, I'm always tired fucking right tired, now. it's the worst. It's and the so fucking worst. I don't have that. And so never will I be like, and so that's why I'm kind of this indefatigable, just never exhausted work ethic. That I just constantly, and it's driven also by wanting to make people feel good wanting to make them laugh because I think life is so fucking tragic you know from almost yeah, every angle for sure and so and the, another reason I like circus because no matter what you're yeah. doing you tune into something Steve is doing right now and you're like everything's gone you're just like is he going to die type of thing yeah and and also you know when you're a great storyteller a person just lets everything go yeah. and sits in the story if you've got a joke that's going to make so I love doing that so much and so I just thought well I should just work as hard as I can until I die and I had to sort of learn not to do that. So that's, that, that's been really helpful for me because now I, I recognize it. I can tell. And yeah, like, I mean, it's been age, can also tell. Like, like it's been a long time since like the, any of that has been in the consciousness, oh, yeah. right? Like, uh, yeah, I think so. And I think the other thing is, is that um, it's a shame that I didn't have a forum then to talk about mental illness. And it's also, it's not just mental illness, it's like, brain damage, you know, and what that can right. leave you with sure. when you're trying to figure it out. Um, isn't that funny? Are you brain damaged at all? Uh, not that I'm aware of. See, I would like, I like think the, be the whippets? You would think it would be the absolute opposite that he would be brain damaged and I wouldn't. You well, know what I mean? right. Well, now, nice. now, like with the CTE thing, they can't find out if you have it until you're dead and they like can look at your brain. So right. I mean, I'm a little bit of a question mark in that regard. Yeah, well, and the nitrous oxide was completely because it was a slowdown. I would never do cocaine or amphetamines or anything like that because I don't need to go that direction. I don't drink coffee, I don't do any of that mm. stuff. Um, but nitrous was so effective at bringing it down. Uh -huh. So I, I was probably in a manic state when I hosted the Critics' Choice Awards, the second one. And so to sort of bring that mania down, I would do nitrous because then it would be gone. Because drinking, that is depressing, it works, but you can't become undrunk like right, right, 15 right. minutes later. Did you ever start hearing voices when you were doing nitrous? A little bit. There, like the psychosis, get yeah, because there it can get pretty bad. The, when I stopped was when, because you do build a tolerance for it. Yeah, and I stopped when I was like, this just isn't. It's not bringing me down enough, right? But it still like gives you it's a crazy. headache. Or it's crazy. Because you did it for a long time. I, right? I did a lot of it, man. And, I did and a lot it, of it. it. It really messed me up. I think. What uh, there is a like a study done by the voices in your head, uh, per like based on the continent you're from, like the psychosis. Some some countries are like a woman's voice. Some countries are a men's voice. Some I, I had never. I like I had I had a whole committee. Did you really? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you, I think, maybe did more of it. I'm surprised you don't have nerve damage. That was another right, problem from uh -huh. it. But um, I, yeah, I would hear sort of echo and then realize it's not my voice. <laughs> That's pretty fucking was scary. Dude, I had voice? one of my voices was, was Tommy somebody, Lee. It was, it was someone who's in transition, I think. I don't really... Yeah. I don't I, define genders I, I, right now. This is 2022. Right. Okay. They identified as they, them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was a they, I them had, voice. I, I, one of my voices was Tommy Lee. Like really? Like very, very distinctly. Like, like yeah, dude. Wow. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's it was the most, another whip it. Fuck yeah, dude. <laughs> yeah, fuck it, yeah, was, yeah. it was the most distinct time, really. And uh, I, 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 I remember wanting to reach out to him, like, dude, this is really you. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Wouldn't that be amazing? And he was like, it was. It was. <laughs> yeah, he's at a computer station. He's yeah, he's just like, hiding behind your fence. <laughs> like, oh, he's doing whippets again. <laughs> All right, dude. Yeah. Anybody else that you like identify? Uh, was it female I, I, voices I, I, I or male voices? I don't remember any like celebrities. There's certainly like pe- personal friends, all kinds of them. Yeah, like um, it, it was wild. And the thing was that I loved it, dude. I yeah, it's a great drug. It. I tell yeah. people that all the time. It is a great yeah. drug, but your upside of the high just immediately goes away after a year or something like that or two years. How long did you do it? Uh, off and on for a long time. Yeah. I'd go through phases of it. But, but dude, everything you were just telling us was, was fucking fascinating, man. You know? Yeah, it's, like, very, it's very bizarre. You know? and, yeah, and, and, and almost like as I like asked that, as you were telling all that story, I almost felt like, man, I've you know, put TJ in an, like, like a, an uncomfortable spot. But I also was so fascinated by it. You know? No, and I'm going to talk about it in my next special. I have a, a story about it from This Is Not Happening at Comedy Central. That I show. It's called TJ uh, Miller Has a Seizure. But, you know, now I'm on medication and have been since 2010, and that's permanent. And so, and what I found out was that I used to be on Keppra, and now I'm on this, uh, this medication, Vimpat, which is sort of the next generation. But after Keppra, after I changed the medication, we were talking to my neurologist, and Kate said, so were there any, like, side effects that, we, that he had from Keppra that, that he, in the... My doctor was like, oh, yeah. And I go, what? And she goes, what do you mean? He goes, oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, mood, in- he goes, mood instability, impulse control problems. That's a big one. And he named all these things, and Kate was like, uh, that's been the problem with everything. And, you know, his attitude was like, yeah, but if he didn't take it, he would die. So uh, why would I tell you, oh, we watch out for these side effects? Because that's him. Other, he's either dead or he's this guy. And so that was the thing, too, is nobody knew that. No employer would ever have been like, well, he has impulse control problems, so if he's going to, like, you know, decide to eat everything in the craft service table as a joke, then get sick, then that's kind of what he's going to do, I guess. we got to just watch out for that. So I never had any of that. So there's another thing that's weird, which is, like, I think people had this concept of me being kind of a crazy guy, but what they didn't understand was fi- that was – it was uh, – a physical thing. It was I was sort of because when I when I first found out about the AVM, I was filming Yogi Bear 3D. It's a children's movie. Mm. Do we, let him know. Do you yeah, let him know it's again? In 3D as well. When the first time you found out about the adult video, <laughs> isn't it the AVN Awards? Yeah, yeah exactly. It, won, it almost won a, about. It almost won a BVN award, which was uh, Bear Bear News videos, and uh, and so. Um, <laughs> And so I was out there, and I'm taught, I'm playing Ranger Jones. So I'm a human. The bears are CGI. And I'm out there in New Zealand. Oh, so, so it's a live action it's, movie. Yeah, it's a live action and cartoon hybrid. You know, it's kind of like Roger Rabbit. Yeah. And so I'm there, and we're I'm I'm depressed. Me and uh, me and one of the other stars drinking all the time, all the time. And it's on the other side of the world, so my schedule is so I just stop sleeping. And I started to go crazy. I didn't know it, but I was became obsessed with entanglement puzzles, and which are like you know the horseshoe, the two horseshoes with the yeah. ring, and you got to try and so that. And then I started to kind of think my mind had elevated, and I was somehow smarter than everybody else. Not like I'm smarter. Than, I just had gotten to a different plane. And then I would I would hear voices. I had a tough time going to sleep. Um, so I had to listen to Morgan Murphy, who's this comedian, and she would talk, and I sort of started, and I really started believing, I narrated my own conversation, so I, if I was, at that point, I would come in and I'd be like, all right, I'm gonna start with a compliment to you, but I'm gonna make my way to talk about how his hoodie no. seems like a mistake, but kind of helps balance out the two of us, and then I'm gonna connect our experiences as clowns, and then we're gonna sort of do a clown bit type thing, and I'll, I'll bring that all back to the compliment that you got. So go ahead, Thank you. Yeah, and so I, I would do that, and then I brought these two girls from uh, Liverpool, England, I met them on Chat Roulette, and I flew them to New Zealand, and they stayed with me uh, for the rest of the movie, and it wasn't like a um, sexual thing. I just brought them to bring a new, fresh perspective to the movie set, 
so that everybody could see the movie through the eyes of people that weren't sort of bogged down by it because it took forever. It was a really hard movie to shoot, everything. So I was doing all this stuff, and then I came back, and I did so much fucking nitrous because at that point, I had a brain hemorrhage, a very small bleed. So there's overactivity specifically in this part of my head, which is the one that works on language and all that kind of stuff. And I was going so fast I couldn't sleep. So I was just doing nitrous all the time, all the time, morning to night, constantly, spending thousands of dollars on nitrous oxide. Because it costs about a dollar for a cartridge. So it's like the most expensive high you could ever imagine. How long does a cartridge last you? Like what, 30 hits? seconds? I mean, no, it's one hit. You just do one cartridge completely. And you were doing like the. Um uh, yeah, yeah. The, the whipped cream dispenser, the dispenser. I got really good at like having two of the dispensers, so I'd, like I'd be like filling them up, like going back. I got to a point where I could just about not breathe in anything except nitrous oxide. Oh, because you, yeah, if you hold your breath, you get just more to high. the exclusion of oxygen. Yeah, but I would. I would <laughs> that's insane. That I wasn't doing. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Oh, was it was because it, I read. What, what, was your goal to what's called fish out, where you lose consciousness and you're like flopping around like a fish? No, I think that's a major difference between you and me. That's what. That's all I wanted, and I would be holding my breath and holding, sucking in more, and like writhing around the floor. Like I'd be mad at myself, like if I couldn't hold my breath until I lost consciousness and flopped around. You like would a know fish. you're doing this. No, but I would find out when I woke up, and I'd be like, yes. <laughs> really? Dude, you are so fucking hardcore. No, but I would do the two dispensers at once and do both of them at once or one after the other. But I'd read somewhere that the oxygen nitrous cut if, that the dentist's office gives you is 70-30 nitrous it, it, yeah. to air. And so I would try and kind of gauge that. I'd sort of do, uh, and then yeah. regular air, and then, <laughs> yeah, it was ridiculous. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's like a dollar a cartridge. So for an afternoon, you can spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars. It's a bad drug to have unlimited money. Yeah. You'd be able to buy as much as you want. Yeah. Um, Where do you buy this shit at? At the smoke, smoke shop. shops. And then they become dealers, and you kind of go in there, and they give you a better price for the 100 packs. And I would get a case of the 24 boxes. 25 per case, so it's, I think that comes to 600. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, and I, had, I found a place I could buy them online, and Kate got so mad at me once because she came... And she like was like, these two boxes came from they're so heavy and I it took me forever to get them up. And she's like, What are in those? And I had forgotten. And yeah. I was like, I don't know. Open ah, them dude, up. You didn't forget. And she that, saw it. She goes, This is all nitrous oxide. And I was like, Oh yeah, it's for us. <laughs> I thought we would enjoy it. She's like, What the fuck are you doing? Happy anniversary. Right, exactly. No, I mean, you know, it's. I would also do shit on nitrous. If you're, like, in it, you start to kind of fog. That's what happened to me. Instead yeah. of fishing out, I would fog out. So right, you right, of, right. It gets, like, foggy, right. And, and, and you write regrettable emails? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Often to myself. It's just like, go cancel this order that you sent to your wife's studio. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was... So I got back from Yogi Bear 3D, was just crushing cartridges nonstop, and then I had this seizure, and then another seizure, and when I got there, they did a, a scan, and they were like, you have an AVM, which is something we usually find in autopsy. So most people, they only find it after they're dead. And, um, and so I was really, really lucky, and it was Cedar sinai which is the great hospital. Yeah. And they performed surgery, they embolized it, and then you know removed it. And I, I remember they were like- This is in 2010? Yes. So that, that's the brain surgery. That was the brain surgery. It was like So do you March have a killer 15. scar or is it under your hair? Yeah, it's under my hair, but it's, yeah, I have, if you, I can't do it without a mirror. But it's, yeah, there's yeah. a scar that goes from yeah. here all the way down. And I need to do a movie where I shave my head and look like an insane person because that would be a good, it's a good look for a villain. Um, but I... I went in and they said, look, this, we do this surgery, but one out of 10 people that do it die. And that's just kind of statistics. We just have to tell you that it's a 10% fatality rate. But if you didn't get the surgery. So I asked, I said, well, will I still be funny after the surgery? And the doctor was like, what? <laughs> He's like, what are you talking about? And I was like, well, that's kind of my livelihood. And it's also, it's what I do. It's what makes life worth living for me is making other people laugh. So. Will I still be funny? And he's like, 
I mean, I think so, because you're not really using that part of your brain. So yeah, I guess. And I go, okay. And I go, what happens if I don't get the surgery? He's like, well, you probably die when you're in your mid-30s, like 35. And I was like, I'm a gambling man. Let's roll the dice, you know? And now I'm here, and you guys have better hot sauce for it, you know? Yeah, dude. Big so time. So made it, made it through that, and then took the Capra, which is that one that made me crazy, uh, mildly crazy. And then I got off of it because they told me it was elective, so I just stopped taking it for like 11 days. Man, that's something. this doctor that didn't tell you about the side effects and said you would die if you didn't take it. Now you learn it's elective. Well, so here's what it was. He, he, that, this was before he said you'll, so he goes, it's elective. His name is Dr. Sokol. He's the best neurologist maybe in the world. He's world renowned. And he said, it's elective. You don't have to take it, but you should. And so then I decided five years later, I'm going to stop taking it. And I had a seizure in like two weeks, you know? So then he said to me, when he saw me again, he goes, okay, now you're, there's a percentage of people that they have to take Keppra and it's a smaller percentage. So you're in the small percentage that didn't die. You're in the smaller percentage that has to take Keppra or you will die. Whoa. And so that's kind of where you are. So I actually, in that world, I'm like, like a case study because I also become incredibly successful while still having this AVM condition. And I'm probably, I'm, I am, I'm the most high, high profile person with this type of brain damage. Um, but it's, it's been so good now. I mean, the train thing was so awful for so many reasons, but I was so... And that, that was like five years ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah. And it's... But I was so lucky to find this cognitive remediation, this, you know, this psychologist, this neuropsychologist who said, we've really got to help you learn how to do the things that other people do without thinking. Yeah. And so as she's helped me mm -hmm. do that, it's gotten a lot better. And I worked for so long. I'm going to ask you about this. I worked for so long with the brain damage, using alcohol to bring, using nitrous oxide to bring the mania down, also using it to trigger mania so that I could get more and more work done, that I had to learn how to work without feeling like I need to do this, this, that, I gotta stay up, I can't go to sleep, I gotta, da. did you feel like you had to do that when you sort of got completely sober? I had to just put work aside and just make make sobriety the only priority for me and i did that for for really like the first two years you know what it's really we're, fortunate we're, that you could do that yeah you know? with, with some exceptions but uh what about your life that did you need to work on for two years like was it just basic functions of like a, what a normal per like what what were you working on in that two years putting everything I, I aside mean, except for just uh just like getting routines figuring out who I, you are I, I had to i had to put down the camera i had to just not be an attention whore i had to like just commit myself to spiritual practice and figuring out what that means like uh I remember you always sobriety. made your bed when we first met you always made your bed and you're up by nine yeah, that's a big thing, right? Yeah, was that like because because I don't do that still, and I'm like, okay, was it stuff like that? Like, okay, yeah, is... that's some structure and and, and yeah. discipline and just sobriety and you know, like I, I had really humiliated myself in, in in my run with drugs and alcohol, particularly towards the end, and uh, that the humiliation I really like hung on to it as like motivation to just take sobriety so seriously. And, and once I had a foundation in sobriety, then I uh, in, in integrated all the attention horn back into my life. And so I, it was, so it was. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Was it hard to go back to performing without being on drugs? Wasn't hard at all. It, 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 like uh, the, the absence of the drugs wasn't, you know, if anything, I, 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 I came to learn that the drugs and alcohol were all, all they had done was it was just fuck shit up. It was, it, was, yeah. it was an impediment to it, right. you know, like like coming back into the attention whore business, clean and sober. I think I I was 
way more effective, way more creative, like and managing, like. The, what was the first thing you did back? Was it the Dancing with the Stars or the Dancing with the Stars, I was one year sober. So that, I, I kind of don't even count that. What about Jackass? Jackass 3D, we were just, had begun filming it when I turned two years sober. Okay, but and, nothing in between the first year? Did you? I, I, I didn't do shit. I, I, I volunteered at a nursing home. Oh, I, nice. I, I, nice. Yes. I, uh, I, I led games of bingo for really? old, old people in a nursing home. Did yeah. anybody know who you were? No, I don't think so. I cool. love that. That's really good. And then when you went to Jackass 3D, was it hard that you were now sober and other people weren't? Or they, were they fucking? Because in my mind, I wanted to ask you this. In my mind, those are the guys that would be like, not that they're bad dudes. So those are the guys that would be like, here, have a cup of tea. And it's just like loaded with fucking vodka. No, no, those guys took it so fucking seriously. Like they, they, uh, they it was like, it was like a dry set. Steve was sober. You, we respect that. You yeah. know, like you can't, you know, and, and, uh, there are a couple of people that drank on set anyway, but you know, yeah. that, like, uh, that's great. That's what I think that they would have done. So they, that they, movie they were, wasn't hard at all for you not in terms at all. of sobriety. It was not not at all. It was uh, yeah. The, the guys were so supportive, and it, it makes sense that they that they should have been so supportive because God was I a fucking nightmare when I was yeah. Alone. That was the other side. I was a was lot like, easier. Maybe they were like, thank God. Yeah, sure. for sure. Yeah. And, and my relationships with all of those guys improved just dramatically because I was clean and sober. It was uh, I was just a lot easier to be around. Yeah, what do you do when fans are like, take a shot, take a shot with me, just say, hey, I'm sober? I didn't know they're like, I'm your biggest fan, dude. Will you take a shot with me? It's like, well, if you're my biggest fan, you would know I'm 15 years sober. Oh, yeah. That's 14 great years. 14. Yeah. yeah. There you go. I mean, I wouldn't even, I wouldn't ever say that, but uh, I mean, I don't know. I, 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 I don't take a, you know, do a shot with me very seriously. It doesn't affect me too much. Yeah, I just was interested in yeah. that. And I, and I think that it's kind of a, as a rule in, uh, you know, the community of sober people who really, like, kind of take it seriously. Yeah. Like, um, we, we have our things that we do to kind of uh, protect our sobriety so that all of these, these things that aren't too big of a deal. Yeah, and then do you do you go to meetings? Did you take uh, the out route? Yeah, I mean, I do. Like, we, we, we don't necessarily talk about it at a public level much, but yeah, I don't ever want to go, like, a week without doing that, so. Yeah. No, yeah, no, all, my, so I asked my these. sister, is like, a, she's a daily meeting person. Right, okay. No matter where she is. Right. So I was interested in that, too. But I think, you know, I Nikki Glaser is a good friend of mine, and she kind of quit drinking, and it just it helped her so much. You know sure. what I mean? And I think what I realized, I used to drink so much, but it was because of the mania. And, the, and so yeah. now that I'm not, like, on that, I don't need it in that way, it's just it's really improved my life because I'm not like drunk. The the only real problem I ever had, I didn't find this out until is I never got hung over. So I never understood maybe I've uh. even been hung over like ten times in my life. Whoa. And so everybody else wakes up and they're like, oh my God, that's the worst. I feel like shit. And I would wake up and be like, All right, let's go. What do we want to do? Have a couple beers and then let's head to the day. So <laughs> that was the problem with that manic energy is it could just blow through. Yeah. And I'm also, the medication I take makes me very thirsty, so I'm always way more hydrated than, than other people. I think that helps too. But that was weird. I really didn't realize that until a year or two ago that people would say, ah, it's so great because now I don't drink and I wake up and I don't have a hangover. Right, and right. I was like, what do you mean? Mm -hmm. Like, I didn't, that just didn't track for me. So, yeah. hangover? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm looking to hang under. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it was, you know, those, so that, that type of drinking and that type of drug use, the nitrous and everything, that was definitely, I think, an impediment. The problem is now I'm trying to learn how to work at that speed, but safely and without using alcohol or weed to like, cause I, for a long time I was like smoked weed every day, most of the day, and it would either get me manic or it would chill me out and I didn't have to be manic depending on if it was an indica or sativa. So not having to base any kind of drug use or having drinks or anything on medicating a brain injury, 
uh, now my life is like so different. Yeah. Were you, were you really blazing it, uh, like taking bong loads in Silicon Valley? Sometimes. I kind of, you know, I left that show after four seasons in part because no one is ever like my favorite uh, season of Breaking Bad, season seven. Yeah. You know? No one, after a show goes four or five seasons, it doesn't get better. That's why they say jump the shark, you know? Mm -hmm. So we got to that point. And also, I was kind of on autopilot. It wasn't interesting to me, and I knew the characters so well, and we'd done so much with it. It was I, so fucking good. It was good, so man. funny. I, I was, I'd gotten to a point where I was kind of, yeah, I could totally go in and do, I would always get high when I was done with my coverage. I would just smoke in my I feel trailer. like your character would like take actual, like bong loads on the show. Uh, like, were that, you? So that is a Hollywood weed, but which you, is you not never did real. real. I threw a little in there. <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> and, uh, and so, but I would. Um, I feel like nobody else in the fucking world could have played that role, dude. Like, you, you were so goddamn genius in that Thank role. Thank you, man. Fucking yeah, it was. Genius. I mean, that's all Mike uh, Judge. I just yeah. talked to Jimmy O. Yang a couple days ago. He's I, the best. We live in the same city, and I always like pass him on the street, but I never say what's up. Really? You got to say what's up. He's I mean, the nicest dude, guy. I'm just yeah. like, I'm such a fan of, of you on that show. Thank dude. you, man. Yeah, I mean, I'm about to maybe do. This Christmas movie where I think no one else can play Santa in the way that I can play <laughs> Santa. Uh, I and, love it. Yeah, it's gonna be great. But yeah, it's you know I I would smoke a little bit, but I said I gotta I have to take off and do something else. It's the same reason like after Deadpool two, I was like I can't do this character again. If he had his own movie or something, but I've sort of done this character, and then people be like I can't I can't believe you're not gonna do Deadpool three. Why would you? And I always say, um, Have you seen Hangover three? And they're like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, didn't it kind of taint Hangover 1? And everyone's yeah. like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I also think being in the third sequel of anything, you know, being the third installment of a franchise, yeah. it's it's a problem. You know, only in Marvel has it, they've been able like to Police sort Academy, of do that. Academy, that got pretty bad, too. Uh -huh. Police Academy got pretty bad. Yeah. Jaws got pretty bad. Yeah. The Godfather 3 wasn't that great. Because yeah. yeah. it always feels like a cash grab, because that's what it is. Yeah. You know, yeah. the story's been told, the story that could have been after is told. Maybe you do a prequel and that's interesting, but the third, horror oh. movie some, I mean, you know. Yeah. Shit, you just reminded me that we've got a new House of the Dragon. What's that? The prequel to Game of Thrones, Sunday oh, night's oh, new that's episode. right. See, I can't, Kate and I loved Game of Thrones until the dragons. We just were like, we're not Dungeons and Dragons. We like the power struggle and the yeah, movie yeah, or whatever. Yeah. But then when fake dragons come in, we kind of lost interest. But you love it. I mean, I'd like a, the, when, 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 the, when the dragons are flying across the screen, yeah, it's a little bit whack. But, but it is so fun, though. It doesn't ruin the whole thing for me. Yeah, it is so, so fun. Yeah. I love that you loved Silicon Valley, both of you oh guys. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's so Dude, good. We, we were on tour together, and it was just like fucking, it couldn't get enough yeah, it, of it. Yeah, it was a fun show. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really fun. Really good. You, you said something earlier about, like, it sounded like uh, as you've gone through, you, you become more famous. Yeah. Like, uh, th th it, that, that's rad. Like, th you've, you've got, like, huge projects and still more huge projects in the, in the works. Yeah. I'm just looking at the list of things that I wanted to talk to you about. Um, but yeah, yeah I, think I, mean, we're, I think we're already uh, officially the longest episode we've ever recorded. <laughs> That's uh, amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. That's true. It's amazing. People I, beg for longer ones, so here they go. They get it. Yeah, like, look, I love it. And so I, um, uh, yeah, I'm, we have this Christmas movie idea that's amazing. That me and my buddy, it's his idea. We wrote it together. We just pitched it to the Russo brothers. I talked to Michael Bay yesterday. We're going to Miami this weekend. Nice. Trying to nail him down. He's so he's so funny. Our texting is like two like junior high students that like each other, but don't you know what I mean? It's like he'll ghost me if I make fun of him. They'll like wait a while and they'll try and hit me back and make fun of me. But he's a good dude. I like him a lot. I so, like uh, what I heard about him, and he just has crates of GoPros on the set. He just like yeah, totally. He's the craziest. I mean, he's so ridiculous to work with. And he's always screaming, he's doing it, but he's actually really, really funny and he's really, really sweet. And so who he is when he's working and the reputation he has, Kate's never seen him on set. So she's like, he's the sweetest guy. And I'm like, yeah, but he's really, it's, it's kind of, it can be a nightmare on set if he wants to be. And she's like, I just don't see it. Mm. I just can't imagine. Yeah. 
But he came to a show of mine in uh, like near Hollywood, Florida. So I'm going down to Miami. That's where he lives. So I think my buddy's coming with me. We're going to pitch to him. And then uh, Seth MacFarlane's company, we're going to go the first week of October and pitch to them. I mean, so I we'll can't imagine Michael Bay making a Santa movie. It, 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 it seems counterintuitive. Whereas Seth MacFarlane making a really irreverent Santa movie with T.J. Miller, like I can... So I can't, I can't more. give it away. That makes more sense. And the Russo brothers really... But it's like... This is why we pitched the Russo brothers. It's like Marvel Avengers Endgame level Santa. Christmas movie. Nice. Yeah. Isn't okay. that insane? So it's Slow real, up. and I can't because the the whole thing of the movie is like the conceit of it. So I can't give you the elevator pitch on the podcast. But that's the main thing that we're working on from that perspective. Because and what's funny about going and pitching this is at the end of it, I'm like. So in this movie, I'm going to play kind of a version of Santa Claus. If you're concerned about me starring in a Christmas movie as Santa Claus, look no further in my resume to when I starred in a Christmas movie as Santa Claus in Office Christmas Party. And so it's really a weird thing where I'm saying I have another Christmas movie, but it's PG-13, and it's bigger. It's big, All big, right. biggest. So that's the kind of thing that I'm working on there. And then I did this, I wrote this... Um, this show, it's like a limited series. I might do it just as a movie. It's called The Loneliest Megaplex, and it's about the pandemic. It's like in June 2020, summer 2020, they opened up movie theaters, but nobody was seeing movies. Yeah. And so in this, I get hired back to my job at the movie theater, but I'm the only one they hire. So I'm the concessions guy, ticket taker, manager, janitor, everything. And it's a 30-screen megaplex, and each episode is the one person or a couple people that come in to see a movie that day. And it's super funny, but it's super sad. Like I did these two um, Sundance shorts. One was called Successful Alcoholics, and the other was called I'm Having a Difficult Time Killing My Parents. I like that. I just went to yeah, that one because like, I, like, I didn't try and kill my parents. Um, <laughs> I want this has not been shot. The the loneliest megaplex. Not yet, no. Because it, it just struck me. I was like, I had the thought, wow, the loneliest. Place. It seems weird to make a a, mo a sort of retroactively a movie about the heat of the pandemic yeah. or, or a series. But then I thought, ooh, what if uh, when when you make it, what what if it was more of a, a, a more futuristic? And it's like here in in the year. 2030 and the next pandemic comes but it's like the most fucking lethal virus that the pandemic is so like so it's like even like bump it up a bunch of notches for like the pandemic where people are really freaking yeah, out yeah and that could be a flash forward you know what I mean yeah. there's also one where I'm in the movie theater and nobody comes for like a week yeah. or something so I start to go crazy, and so that could be a fever dream of like what it'll be like in 2030, exactly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, so I love that, and it's kind of like those Sundance shorts that I did, which you can see online, and um, they are uh, they're funny, but they're they're comedies of substance, is what I call it, pun intended on the alcoholic one. But like, it's um, it's just they're real, they're sad, but they're hilarious. You know, so that's what the loneliest megaplex I think is going to be. But the biggest thing is this shooting a special Dear Jonah and shooting Philosophy Circus. Like, I haven't done a special in a long time, but what I've been Since doing the is HBO one where you're pouring the water. So that's called Meticulously Ridiculous. So I did that one. That's that was a while ago. It was like six yeah, years that... ago. And then before that, I did one for Comedy Central called uh, No Real Reason. Um, but this is like these are the first stand-up specials that I shot after I was touring as just a stand-up. Because so often I was getting so much acting work that I was just slotting in stand-up. And I got in trouble on Silicon Valley for that, too. I would work for 14 hours, then go, and that night everybody else would go home and go to sleep or look at their lines for the next day. I would go straight out and do two shows, three shows, Jesus. hang out afterwards, talk shop, go home, go to sleep at 2, wake up at 5 a.m. for the call on Monday to go and do that. And that was just the schedule that I was doing. And because I don't get tired, I would start to get manic. And then once I had a psychotic episode, and that was like, have you ever had one of these? That had some nitrous involved for sure, but that was also alcohol and marijuana. 
But that was one where I thought that the birds were drones from the government. Oh, shit. I thought that the Chinese government was watching <laughs> me through the camera. I smashed my computer because I was sure of it. I remember, this is very real to me to this day, I was, a website was loading and it just said, visit China, go to China, 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 Chinese tourism, come to China. And it would load in between. And I was like, the Chinese government is clearly trying to get me to go to China. And it's real. I remember exactly what it looked like. It can't be real, but it's definitely an actual memory that I have. And then you have that classic thing. Do you ever have this? It almost seems kind of hack as it's happening, but where the television is talking to you. Did you ever have that? I had that on mushrooms once. Uh, really? Watching Baywatch. I, That's slightly better than mine. Mine was the news. And they were like, this is your fault. I, I had that with music. A song would all of a sudden start saying things to me. But I don't yeah. remember a TV. I remember looking at a carpet, and the carpet, uh, like the, the, what do you call it, the bristles of the carpet, like just took its own form, and it turned into a, a pornographic scene. The, the, the carpet itself was a porno in it. And how was the porno? It was uh, just so wild that it was a porno. Like, I, I couldn't really evaluate, like, the quality of the... Yeah, you're probably too high to even find your penis <laughs> at that point. Uh, yeah, I, it was so weird. But you watch the news, and they are talking to you, and they're giving yeah. kind of secret messages to you. And I had read about that, and that's why I thought it was so hacked. But when it's happening, you're like, this is happening. This is actually happening. So I had to... I didn't go into work... Um, Silicon Valley the next day because that would have been an actual disaster and that's I think when Mike Judge because years later he would say because um, we're still friends but years later he'd be like yeah it just TJ kind of seemed like he didn't want to be there and that wasn't the case it was so much the case that I loved the show I was just running myself into the ground and kind of having this brain condition all the while and so that has been that. so that was that's like how bad it can get, you know? Yeah. But now, thankfully, I haven't had any kind of psychotic split or anything like that since the train incident. Oh, good. So it's been really, really good. And mostly it has to do with this cognitive remediation about just planning. It sounds insane, but it's like Kate and I will be like, so let's like, I don't know, let's go get a couple drinks, we'll have a few glasses of wine, then let's try and leave by like 9 o'clock. And then it's fine. But we never would talk about that beforehand. And, and she's also kind of crazy. And so things just would get out of hand. And then we would want to hang out with each other and stay up all night. And then I would have to leave at 7 in the morning to go on. And all of that I was just doing and thinking it was fine. And it's actually really, really dangerous. So is it the stress of spot nanny? Like, is it like that's what kind of gets you there? Is like if you plan it out, like your brain is like, okay, there's some structure. But if you're like, do you, maybe you get stressed out if you're just like, okay, fuck it, let's just go and see what happens. Well, I think what it's really is so much about sleep. I mean, I think people, you know, you, I'm sure when you saw the stuff going on with me, you were immediately like, whoa, this is a serious drug alcohol situation. Yeah. But it was so much more about sleep. And so if I had just like paid attention, but I couldn't sleep because I thought that the world was attacking me because someone had lied about something because they're mentally ill, and that's kind of all I'll say about that. But it was, I, it was so insane to feel like all of Twitter and the world hated you and believed this thing about you, and, thought, and so I just couldn't sleep. It was just the worst thing in the world. If I ever went on the internet, people were like, TJ Miller is the worst person in the world, I wish he was dead. And so because of that, you start spinning, you sleep less, you sleep less, and then you start to get manic. So what do you do? I need to have a couple drinks. We're on the train. Let's just have a couple drinks. I can't, you know what? I need to sleep. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to do that. I have a drink and I'm going to sleep. You know, mm -hmm. I probably shouldn't sleep. I just need it because I really got to think about it. You know what? I should be working right now. And it's that just like a train. It's kind of the locomotion of it is go faster, 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 and then click. The track clicks in and you can't stop. And so yeah. it goes all the way. I'm lucky that it wasn't like, an alcoholism thing where I was driving drunk and hit a kid. You know what I mean? Right, sure. And I know that you've talked about your experience with drinking and driving. You're not proud of it, but right. I love how you talk about it. And I love that video of all your arrests. I really yeah. like that. Cause I like you, you are so interesting as a performer, as a maniac, as a stunt man, um, as a comedian, all of those things as a clown. Okay. Um, but 
more interesting is you now and seeing your, you know, hindsight and your retrospective and being able to have, it's fascinating because you're the same person, but it's, you're talking about a completely different person. And then I always think about this and that person had no idea right. about you at the time, had no idea you exist or that you were going to be the whole deal, what heights you were going to get to. So I think that's really, really amazing. And I just feel lucky that I didn't get into a situation where I, right. um, but you don't have a manic episode and like go out and hit a kid. And well, in Silicon Valley, I know I hit a kid and I call him a cunt, but it's in general, <laughs> the manic episode is more about psychology and right. getting out. So the, the, the split, the big problem is you completely distancing yourself from reality. And so in that world, being helpful ends up being dangerous. Type right. of thing. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah. So it's, but the spontaneity, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. And I don't think it stresses me out to um, like structure my life, but it's really, um, it's really hard for me. It's just, it doesn't come naturally in any way, shape, or form. And you know, what you're talking about, it's like for alcoholics or drug addicts, sometimes it is about structure. Get up, make the bed. Right. Know about this. Coffee is from here to here. I'm going to a meeting at this time. Yeah. And so, you know, lots of people have problems with that. It's just I needed somebody to like sit with me and help me understand. I mean, it doesn't, maybe it sounds crazy, maybe it doesn't, but to me, how insane is it that to understand if I'm tired, I have to look at myself and oh, see do, you do know I have what physical. Would help you? I think what would what, help what, you what? a lot, uh, this, this whoop band, it gives you all of your uh, information about your sleep. Dude, well, that's well, this. It's an aura uh, ring. Okay, aura cool. ring. Yeah, it's great, right? You like the whoop band? I, I love the whoop band. Yeah, yeah, this is a ring, and it does, I think, essentially it, the same stuff. It'll tell it's you vital. like, like uh, how long you're in bed, how much of that time you were asleep, yeah, how insane. many, uh, like uh, each stage of sleep, yeah. like the percentage of it. Um, Super helpful. So, I, so, so without being able to determine uh, based on your the way you feel, you can have like the actual analytics of your sleep. So that's exactly what this is. And the Aura Ring does readiness in the morning, and that's like how well your sleep is and how what you should be planning on for the day. So that's helpful. But I'm the same way as you. I love saying like, okay, this was this much REM. This was this much yeah. deep yeah. sleep. I need more deep sleep. What can I do? What did I do that night? Oh, we got a massage before we went to sleep. Okay, sauna. that must help. Yeah, sauna. Did we get in the hot tub before? Whatever it was that happened to happen. And also it's, you know, stuff like, and everybody should be doing this, but uh, not looking at a screen for like a half right. an hour before for you go sure. to sleep. All that right. stuff, which is really, really hard to do. do oh, are those, that? It's impo yeah, it's impossible. Are those glasses you're wearing like blue, they look like blue blocking glasses. No, but they're great because they get rid of, they mute all the fluorescent all the lights, all the artificial lights. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> blocking out the haters. Hey, uh, mm -hmm. dude, they keep texting me saying somebody's waiting to get in here at 2 o'clock. It's oh, been amazing, shit. man. I, I'm I, so I'm happy. So, I feel so bad because... Dan, I, can, can, can we do a speed round hour? of things that I wanted to ask you? Yeah, please. Yeah. Maybe you guys will have me back. What did you think of this? Uh, Most importantly... Uh, I, I, don't, I went straight to fucking insane. Loved it. What you think? Loved Good? It. Yeah. I loved it. Best everyday use and this is just great did you try this with the papaya i, I didn't i only had so something good. insane i this didn't is the best anything with else the, I, I love it all um and they can get those at uh, your website yes tj miller does not have a website.com and i'm gonna hook you up with our amazon people if you want to get this on amazon yeah that would be amazing yeah, cool. that would be really really great um i so you have a hip-hop album I did put out a hip hop mixtape. It is fascinating. So I have a hip hop album. It's like a <laughs> fake one also, but it's called the Extended Play EP. The sad thing is that I I, I didn't realize it was fake at the time. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just talking about mine. I said right. I have a fake hip hop album. Also, I just meant in addition to my other work. You guys that should I've do done. another song together. We really should. Oh, yeah, I would love that. But I really, really, I did it. It's an EP, but it's 41 tracks. Some of the tracks are less than six <laughs> EP, seconds long. EP, 41 tracks. Yeah. So I yeah, it. so I was wondering about that, but yeah, um, let's let, let's switch numbers. We'll collab on a rap song. Let's do it. I love your MTV Cribs. I just want to say it was so absolutely hilarious because you look like I'm dressed like a teenage millionaire. You look like just a hood rat millionaire. I mean, I, it was <laughs> so amazing. And then I just wanted to finish by saying I'm not allowed to perform in Terrebonne Parish, Louisiana anymore either. Wow. Wow. We'll talk, we'll talk about that next Clowns? time. There are a couple of counties. Yep. 
circus. In Louisiana, I've done some crazy shit in Louisiana. Hey, also. I wish that uh, I think Louisiana is the only state that doesn't have the term county. They have the term parish, yeah. which is I mean, I wish it was just called Terrebonne County. It would be so much more meaningful to explain my lifetime ban. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> but you know, it's kind of funny that it's a parish. It seems even more like religiously it's, it's offensive. Religious, yeah. It's, it's almost religion. satanic. Yeah. What you've done here is too close to Satan. Yeah. Never come back to Terrebonne. It's got a, it's got a religious connotations. And yeah, dude, fuck. Like, it, this has been now by far the longest uh, episode of the Wild Ride podcast we've ever recorded. And what an honor to do it with you. It's been such a wild ride. Yeah. More to come. Yeah, dude. Thank you, man. Thank yeah, that you. was a pleasure. Dude, awesome. There you have it, one of my new favorite guys. And officially, the longest episode of the Wild Ride podcast ever recorded. That son of a bitch was so long that our uh, beloved podcast guru got his dream come true. Four sponsors. Never done that before. But hey, that's what happens when you got a fucking damn near two hour long podcast. You got more room for sponsors. Uh, God, I'm exhausted. I'm fucking absolutely fucking exhausted. I love you guys. I'm going to bed. <laughs>